In this video, we're going to talk about enzymes. So what are enzymes? Enzymes, at least most of them, are protein-based catalysts that speed up chemical reactions. And the way they speed up chemical reactions is by lowering the activation energy. So let's draw an energy diagram. We have energy on the y-axis, the reaction coordinate on the x-axis. In blue, this would be the uncatalyzed reaction. So this is the energy of the reactants, the products, and the difference between the energy of the transition state and the reactants is the activation energy. Now, in red, I'm going to show the energy diagram with the use of a catalyst. So the energy of the reactants and products will be the same, but notice that the energy of the transition state is a lot less. So as you can see, with the catalyzed reaction in red, the activation energy has been decreased. And that's how enzymes speed up chemical reactions. Now, most enzymes are protein-based catalysts, but there are some enzymes that are not made up of proteins. And these are RNA catalysts known as ribozymes. Now, let's get rid of this picture. It's very easy to identify an enzyme if you're given its name. Enzymes, they have the suffix ACE. For instance, sucrase is an enzyme that breaks down sucrose into fructose and glucose. So here's the overall reaction. This is sucrose. And then with the enzyme sucrase, this will speed up the chemical breakdown of sucrose into glucose and fructose. Now, enzymes have an active site with a unique three-dimensional shape that is specific for the substrate that it binds with. So let's use this reaction as an example. So this will be the enzyme. And this is going to be the substrate which is sucrose. Sucrose is a disaccharide. It's made up of two sugar units, glucose and fructose. So I'm going to write E for enzyme, S for substrate. As you can see, the active site of the enzyme, which is right here, it has a unique shape that is complementary to the substrate. Now, there's two types of models that you need to be familiar with, the lock and key model and the induced fit model. The basic idea of the lock and key model is that the substrate fits exactly with the active site of the enzyme, just as the key fits exactly into the lock, activating the door so that it opens. But the induced fit model, there's a little bit more to it. With the induced fit model, as the substrate enters the active site, the shape of the enzyme changes slightly so that it fits even better with the substrate. So it changes slightly such that it becomes even more complementary to the shape of the, the substrate. So that's the idea of the induced fit model. The enzyme enhances its shape so that it fits better with the substrate. Now let's get rid of this. I'm always running out of space here. So once the enzyme combines with the substrate, we're going to get something called an enzyme substrate complex. Abbreviated ES. So this is when the enzyme is catalyzing the reaction. In this case, the breakdown of sucrose. And then once it finishes doing its job, it's going to return back to its original shape. And then the products will be released. So we have G for glucose, F for fructose. So we have the original enzyme, and these are the products. So as you can see, the enzyme is a catalyst that is not used up in a reaction. So if we were to write the overall reaction of this, so it's going to be S plus E, and then that's going to turn into 
ES, the enzyme substrate complex. That's the intermediate for this reaction. And then it's going to be E plus P, where P is the products. So notice that the enzyme appears in the beginning of the reaction and at the end of the reaction. So the enzyme is not used up in the chemical reaction. It could be reused to react with another sucrose molecule, converting that into glucose and fructose. So make sure you understand that enzymes, they speed up chemical reactions, but they're not consumed in the reaction. Now let's move on to the next point, the factors that affect enzyme activity. So the first one is the pH. Enzymes have an optimal pH upon uh, which they work. Most enzymes, their optimal pH is somewhere between 6 and 8 because your body has a pH between 6 and 8. The optimal pH will be the X value that occurs at this point. So in this example, that would be somewhere around 7. On the Y axis, we have the rate. So at this point, the enzyme it's working at its best, at its highest rate. Now, some enzymes, they have an optimal pH that is not around 7. For instance, the enzyme pepsin has an optimal pH somewhere between 2 and 3 because it exists in your stomach under acidic conditions. Another factor that affects enzyme activity is temperature. And like pH, there's a graph that corresponds to that. So we have temperature on the x-axis and the rate of the reaction on the y-axis. Now, the graph will look something like this. So there is an optimal temperature at which the rate is at its maximum. So below that, increase in the temperature will increase the rate of the enzyme activity. That is the left side because as you increase the temperature along the x-axis, you can see the rate is going up. Now, once you go past that optimal spot or that optimal temperature, as you can see, the rate of the reaction quickly decreases. At certain temperatures, or rather at certain high temperatures, proteins can be denatured. They can lose their shape and thus they can lose their ability to function. And so if the temperature is too high, the enzyme is not going to work as well as it should because of denaturation. So that's something to keep in mind. So proteins, their shape is dependent on the temperature and the pH. Another factor that affects the enzyme activity is the concentration. As you increase the concentration of the substrate or the enzyme, the rate of the reaction will increase as well, up to a limit. If the concentration is too high, once you reach that optimal rate of reaction, increase in the concentration won't work anymore. So let me give you a graph to help you visualize this. So we're going to have the rate of the reaction on the y-axis and the concentration on the x-axis. Let's use Cs to say to represent the concentration of the substrate. So initially, as you increase the concentration of the substrate by moving to the right, the rate of the reaction will increase. Now eventually it's going to level off. So at this point, this is true. Increasing the concentration of the substrate or the enzyme, the rate is going up. Now once you reach that optimal rate of the reaction, which is probably going to be somewhere just above that red line. Once you get close to it, increase in the concentration has negligible effect on the rate of the reaction. As you can see, the rate is not changing much. So this is true up to a certain limit. Now, another factor that affects enzyme activity are the presence of inhibitors and activators. Inhibitors are substances that inhibit the activity of an enzyme. So it slows it down. So let me draw an enzyme. So 
So there goes my enzyme and let's draw a similar substrate that we had before. Now there's two types of inhibitors that you need to be familiar with. Competitive inhibitors, which I'm going to draw in green. So this will be the competitive inhibitor. This inhibitor wants to bind at the active site of the substrate. So if it gets there, it's going to block the substrate from entering that site. So let's put that there. So that will be an example of a competitive inhibitor. If it bonds to the active site, the substrate can't get in. And so it prevents the substrate from interacting with the enzyme. So that's why they're competitive inhibitors. The inhibitor competes with the substrate for the same active site. Now, another type of inhibitor is a non-competitive inhibitor, which I'm going to put in green. So this non-competitive inhibitor, which is also like an allosteric inhibitor, it binds to the allosteric site of the enzyme. So the allosteric site is somewhere away from the active site, which is here. I'm going to write AS for active site. So once that non-competitive inhibitor or allosteric inhibitor bonds to that site, the enzyme changes shape such that it no longer fits with the substrate. So let me go back to my terrible drawing skills. So now the substrate can't bond with this enzyme because it, it no longer fits with the enzyme. So that's how a non-competitive inhibitor could decrease enzyme activity with this substrate. An activator is basically the opposite of an inhibitor. An activator would be something that would activate the enzyme towards the substrate. So those are some factors that affect enzyme activity. In addition, some enzymes require cofactors and coenzymes to function. Cofactors include inorganic metal ions, such as the zinc 2 plus cation, and coenzymes include organic molecules such as vitamins. As you continue to study biology or even biochemistry, you're going to encounter some complicated chemical reactions. And if you could understand the name of the enzyme that catalyzed that reaction, then you could understand what's happening in the reaction. The first enzyme that we're going to talk about is protease. So this is an enzyme that breaks down proteins and polypeptides into amino acids. The second one that we're going to briefly review is lipase. So ACE tells you that it's an enzyme. The root word lip or lipid tells you you're dealing with lipids and fats. Lipase is an enzyme that breaks down fats such as triglycerides into glycerol and fatty acids. Another example is isomerase. So the root word isomer. This is an enzyme that catalyzes rearrangement reactions. It can convert a compound into its isomer. Number four, transferase. So this is an enzyme that is going to transfer something. It transfers a functional group from one molecule to another. The next one is kinase. So this enzyme transfers a phosphate group, particularly from ATP to another molecule. Number six, dehydrogenase. So let's think about this word, hydrogen, and the word D. So this is an enzyme that removes hydrogen atoms from a molecule. Next, amylase. Think of 
starches such as amylose and amylopectin. Well, starch, plant starch, is composed of, for the most part, 20% amylose and 80% amylopectin, if I remember it correctly. But amylase is an enzyme that breaks down starch into simple sugars like glucose. Number eight, oxidoreductase. So think of the word oxidation and reduction. So we're dealing with redox reactions. In a redox reaction, there's a transfer of electrons. In an oxidation reaction, electrons are lost, but in a reduction reaction, a substance picks up or gains electrons. So oxidoreductase is an enzyme that catalyzes the transfer of electrons from one molecule to another. Number nine is hydrolase. So think of the word hydrolysis, using water to split a big molecule into two smaller components. So hydro, excuse me, hydrolase is an enzyme that catalyzes hydrolysis reactions. So those are some enzymes that you may want to familiarize yourself with.